Terry, welcome to the show. So happy to have you. Really looking forward to speaking with you today. Well, thanks for having me on, Brian. I'm looking forward to speaking with you as well. Yeah, definitely. We're going to talk about a lot of a lot of cool stuff. We were chatting a little bit uh, before we hit record and you've been all over. You've done a lot in your life um, before you got to the point where you are right now. Before we get into your W2 prison break story, which everyone is uh, definitely wants to hear, maybe just expand a little bit about some of the things you've done in the past. You know, you've been all over, as, as we had mentioned. So maybe give us a little bit of background, and then we'll dive into some of the topics. Yeah, sure. So, I, I, you know, without going back to birth, you know, born and raised on the south side of Chicago, you can't tell this from my voice or from looking at me, but I'm six foot eight inches tall and I played college basketball at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. I, I have a brother who's six foot seven who pitched for the University of Notre Dame, another brother who's six foot six who was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers, and then my dad was six five. So I sort of joke that if you sat behind our family in church growing up, there wasn't a prayers chance we were going to see anything that, that was going on. Nice. Um, but when I graduated from college, you know, I moved home to find a job. This was long before the internet was available. And I was the first person in my family to graduate from college. And so I was all set to make my mark on the world with my newly obtained business administration degree. And I look back now and realize how little I knew about business just because I had a degree. Fortunately, I was able to find that first job in the marketing department at the corporate headquarters of Wendy's International, the hamburger chain. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I lived with my parents for the next three and a half years as I helped my mother care for my father and my grandmother who were dying of different forms of cancer. Professionally, as I said, started out at Wendy's. Uh, then I moved to healthcare administration. And then I made a major pivot in my life and became a police officer with the city of Cincinnati. And, you know, I was in a marked car, ran a beat, did all that kind of stuff. But I was also an undercover narcotics investigator. And people always laugh at that. It's like, you were six foot eight. How could you possibly have done that? But that was, that's a whole other story we can dive into if, if we have time. Yeah. Uh, and I was also a SWAT team hostage negotiator. And then after that, I started my own school security consulting business. And I coached girls high school basketball. Uh, 2019, I made the brilliant business decision to start a motivation, motivational speaking business right in the middle of the pandemic, uh, <laughs> published my first book in 2020, but for the last 10 years or so, have been dealing with a, a rare form of cancer. Uh, and then I guess finally to round it out, wife and I have been married for almost 30 years. We have one child, a daughter, who's a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and is an officer in the new branch of the military, the Space Force. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So we didn't discuss this, but I am also six foot eight. Are you really? That's I, okay. I am. I am. And maybe I'm shrinking a bit. I, you know, when you, <laughs> when you get older, I, I think I was six, nine at one point, but I heard that I was like, okay. Oh, I, you know, I feel, I feel your pain. Cause I still get people who I, I yesterday I was out uh, where I was out at a Cubs game and I, you know, I'm standing out in front and the guy asked me how tall I was six, eight. And he was just amazed that I had not played basketball either professionally or for, or for, or for college, you know, and you played, I'm getting off topic here, but you played at the Citadel, uh, that's a division one school, correct? Correct. Yeah. It's not easy, right? Not everybody, just cause you're tall. I played basketball. doesn't mean that you're going to get a division. You're going to play division one, uh, basketball. So, um, we've got that in common as well. And I still get, I still get asked to this day, how, how tall I am. It's never going to stop. No, it's not. And, and I always sometimes if I'm feeling, you know, sort of frisky, I'll, you know, people ask me, I'm like, I'm 520, let them go do the math, you know, or something like that. So. You got to get creative because the same question gets asked over and over. And I always, I always, I always have the attitude like they don't know what, well, how many times this has been, you know, asked. Right. And you just have to, you know, you, you just have to, you just have to have a little bit of a little bit of patience there. So you okay, do. good. You so do. we've got two six eighters here, folks. And, uh, you know, we've got, uh, you know, whatever that is 20% of a basketball team. That's right. So you've you you, you went around, you moved around a bit in, in corporate sounds like you did a bunch of things. At what point did you get to the frame of mind where like, I don't want to do this anymore. And I want to do my own thing. Because if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I, I, really, it came for me after my career in, in law enforcement. Uh, you know, my wife has always been the primary breadwinner in our family. 
And as I mentioned, I was a policeman in Cincinnati. She lost her job in Cincinnati and we ended up moving to, to Texas. And so, uh, you know, it was like, well, do I want to go back? And you know, I, I mean, law enforcement is kind of state specific. So just because you were a policeman in Ohio doesn't mean you can just turn around and become a policeman in Texas. I would have had to go through an academy and all that. And, you know, I was well into my 40s at that point in time. And I thought, you know what? I have, I have education, I have a master's degree, I went to law school, I've done all this stuff, I've got all this experience, can I somehow put this together and start my own gig? And, and that's exactly what I did. I, I started a school security consulting business. Our, our daughter went to a private independent school and I went to them and I said, hey, I'll do an assessment of your campus, I'll write your policies and procedures, for free, if you will kind of put the word out there for me. And, and that, that was just, it was so much fun for me to do that. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, my, our daughter, fortunately or unfortunately, got my height and is, is six foot two and has an NBA three-point shooting range. So she actually went to the Air Force Academy to play basketball. And, and the coaches at her school were not that good. And not that I'm a great coach, but yeah. they, they didn't have the background and the experience. So I thought, hey, I'll be happy to coach the team. And so I did. So I was able to kind of ramp my business up in the off season and then kind of scale it back, you know, during the season where I could coach. So it really, it was a family dynamic. It worked for our family. And it was also something that allowed me to do my own thing when I was able to do it. Yeah, that's the beauty of of of, of having your own gig, as as you say, is it gives you that freedom. You have to spend that time with your with your daughter. How long did it take you to? So you 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 you've obviously you have all this experience, and you said, "Hey, I've got some skill here. I've got some knowledge. I can I can do my own thing here." How long did it take you to kind of develop the security business? Um, if you could expand on that as well. Yeah, I, I mean. I had these skills, you know, with my SWAT background and things like that. I, I had the education, you know, I was a pretty decent writer and stuff like that. So, you know, it, that was a time when, you know, we weren't getting a, you know, a mass shooting every week, but it was still something that was on people's minds. And so it, it, it took me a while to kind of, well, what do I want to call this and how do I want to frame this and what skills do I have that I can do and what things can I do? I don't want to overpromise, you know, something that I I'm just not capable of doing. So I, it, it probably took six to eight months for me to figure out how I wanted to do it, the way I wanted to do it. Um, there were there were a couple incidences where I, I was working with a school and all of a sudden they wanted to change the game plan. It was like, wait a minute, we now want you to contract with our attorneys because if something happens. You know, we, we want them to tell you what we what should be in the report. And, and I just went back to him and I'm like, look, I'll walk away from this, but it's my liability. You know, if I see something and I don't say something to you about it and something occurs and it's like, well, why didn't you put that in the report? Well, the attorneys told me not to do it. And, and then again, it was, the, you know, the whole attorney client privilege. If I was, you know, working with them, then there were certain things that I, you know, I could tell them that they didn't, it, there was a privilege there. And so they didn't have to divulge it and things like that. And I was like, you know, that's not what I want to do. I, I, I don't, I don't want to make this about, you know, what are we keeping out? I want to do everything I can to help kids be safe. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, started out with my daughter's school, and, and then I had a, a Jewish school in Texas that came to me where the Mossad, you know, the Israeli Secret Service had come in to assess their school. And I mean, they wanted barbed wire and guys with guns on the roof and stuff like that. And the school was like, we're, we're, we're not doing that. That's just not, you know. So is there something kind of in between where we can have security, but not feel like we're in an armed state? And so that was my first paid gig. I actually did a, a school uh, where Donald Rumsfeld, who was the Secretary of Defense under uh, President Bush, mm -hmm. his grandchildren went to the school. And so they wanted a heightened sense of security. I'm thinking, gosh, I mean, you know, Department of Defense, you could probably have anything you want there. But it was just it was a, it was a lot of a lot of opportunities for me. And, and, and it was working with good people who wanted an honest assessment and, and weren't willing to kind of, well, yeah, don't, let's not talk about that. No, we have to talk about that. That's a problem. That's an issue. We need to address it. hundred uh, percent. I appreciate you doing that. We got to protect our kids, you know, and uh, yeah. it's a great thing. Great thing that you're doing. All right. Let's talk about your, your speaking business. You started the speaking business in 2019. 
uh, what is it about? Who are you speaking with? And then let's get into some of the some of the topics that you cover. Yeah, I, I, it started out as a uh, kind of a deeper dive into what I've learned over these now 10 plus years of dealing with cancer. And, you know, not just that, but also of my time in athletics. I, I think one of the things, one of the important things that I learned as, as part of, of a team, you know, I started playing basketball when I was nine years old, played all the way up until I graduated from college at 21. And, and I think what a team teaches you is the importance of being part of something that's bigger than yourself. You know, you realize on a team that if you don't do your job, not only do you let yourself down, but, you know, you let your teammates down, your coaches down, your fans down, et cetera. And if you think about it, th this what we all play is, is this team game that we call life. And so I started, I, I literally started the, the gig. I, I had a couple uh, um, presentations that I did and then COVID hit and everything locked down. And I was like, well, where do I, where do I go from here? And somebody had reached out to me and said, hey, would you be a guest on my podcast? And my response was, what's a podcast? I, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing or what I was talking about there. And, and, but I agreed to do it. I thought, well, let's see how I can do this. And, and so the speaking gig kind of morphed into being a guest on people's podcasts. And I have been very fortunate to be a guest on probably 500 plus podcasts all around the world, talking to people about mindset, motivation, uh, you know, the need to keep moving forward. And Fortunately, I have yet to have a bad experience. I, it's just been a great opportunity for me to kind of hone my message a little, little bit, and I hope help people along the way. Yeah, that's great. Five hundred podcasts since two thousand nineteen. That's that's you're 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 doing this quite a bit. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is you know a great way to spread the word. It sounds like you've really you know you, you've had some experiences in your life, and you're trying to help other people uh, get through it. And that's what it's all about, right? You are being a team player, Terry. So uh, again, much appreciated for that. Talk to talk to us a little bit about what you refer to as the, the four truths. Yeah, the four truths are, are something that I came out. I actually did a podcast with a woman and it, it, it was uh, it was it had something to do with the truths. And uh, she was like, you know, you need to codify your truths and come on my podcast. And I was like, oh, OK. And, and, and I'm glad she did that because it was a it was just a great opportunity for me to to put down on paper what I believed in. And, and I, I think a lot of times, you know, we're, we're all about, you know, we, we got to develop goals. You know, we've got to develop New Year's resolutions. We've got to develop all these things. But I think what we don't do, and the reason so many of our goals and so many of our New Year's resolutions fail, is that we don't tie them to what our values are. I mean, what do we stand for? What do we believe in our heart? You know, what do we be? What are we willing to die on it on that hill for, so to speak? If we can do that, if we can codify that, and then start to attach goals to that, now all of a sudden you've developed a foundation that you can use, you know, to, to help yourself to, to, to move forward in, in that regard. So I, I came up with these four truths and, and they, originally it was three. I, I've added the, the fourth one kind of within the last year or so. And, and I'll give them to you. They're on a post-it note. I have them right here. I see them every day. So they constantly get reinforced. Mm -hmm. The first one is you need to control your mind or your mind is going to control you. The second one is embrace the pain and the difficulty that we all experience in life and use that pain and difficulty to make you a stronger and more resilient individual. The third one, and this is the one I've added fairly recently, it, it's more of a legacy truth, is what you leave behind is what you weave in the hearts of other people. And then the fourth one is as long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. And, and I look at those, like I say, a, a, as a good foundation for for me to build a quality life off of. So those are my four truths. And, and I use them every day to make decisions on whether I'm going to do certain things or even when I, with my cancer treatment, am I going to get involved in that? Do I want, is that something that I want to do? So they've, they've guided me so far and, and haven't let me down. So I think I'm going to continue to go with them. I love it. I love it. Um, I'd like to unpack all four of those individually, Terry, and we're, we're definitely going to put those in the show notes for sure. But control a lot of people, I think, don't believe that you we have the ability to control our mind to control our thoughts, you know, you don't just wake up and do it. 
someday. It takes effort and practice. So maybe expand a little bit on, you know, some of the techniques, some of the things that you do to control your mind so that it doesn't control you. Yeah, you make a great point, Brian. I mean, it's not something that, you know, if you're a glass half empty person, you just wake up one morning and say, hey, I'm, you know, the glass is half full now. I, I, I guess I learned this early in my life. I, when I was in high school, I had three knee surgeries. And I remember when I went back playing basketball, my brain was putting all kinds of negative thoughts into my mind. You know, things like, hey, you're probably a step slower because you had these surgeries and college coaches aren't going to be interested in recruiting you. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, I'm still playing at an elite level and coaches are still reaching out about the possibility of playing for their college or university. I learned that I need to change that narrative. I needed to put something positive in there. And, and everything I've read is that, you know, we, we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts that pass through our mind every day, many of which we don't even pay attention to. But your brain can only hold one thought at a time. Why would you want to make that a negative thought? And so what I do, and, and, and I think people get all like, you know, we, we, we want instant gratification. You know, I'm, I'm a negative person. I want to be a positive person tomorrow and I want it to happen overnight. It's not going to happen overnight. It, and, and the way I suggest people deal with this is understand that you're going to have negative thoughts. It doesn't make you a bad person or anything like that. We all have those thoughts in our mind. But when you recognize that thought that it's there, recognize it and then change it. Change it to something positive, something that's beneficial to you, and then go on with your day. And then when you recognize another thought, change that thought into something that's more positive. And over time, and it's going to take several months at minimum, over time, your brain is now going to start to expect those positive thoughts. Because I mean, it, it's really more evolutionary than anything. It's like anytime you want to step outside your comfort zone, you know, your brain is like, oh, absolutely not. You know, no, no don't do that. We don't want that. And, and so it's, it, it uses your fears. It uses your vulnerabilities against you as a way of saying, no, don't do that. I mean, Brian, it'd be like you woke up, woke up this morning and said, I'm going to go skydiving. I mean, your brain would start to put all kinds of, well, you shouldn't do that. The parachute may not open or, you know, the plane may crash. Or I mean, you will get all these negative thoughts. If you really want to go skydiving, you're going to have to overcome that fear by putting something positive in place of that negative thought. Yeah. That's great. Uh, you you really nailed it there. Uh, very clear uh, practice. It's practice, right? You got to be aware. Number it one, it's creating a new habit. Yeah, yeah. These negative thoughts are never going to go away. I mean, I practice. No. I practice awareness. I've been practicing for years, but it, you know they're still there. Like it's okay. You were human beings. Negative thoughts are going to come in. So it's just the practice of 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 being aware of it. Like, hey, this is what's happening and turn it to something else. I love that. That's, uh, that's great. So number two was embracing the pain and difficulty and using it to make you stronger, make you a stronger and more determined individual. Could you expand on that a little bit more? I love this one. Yeah. I mean, our brains are hardwired to avoid pain and discomfort and to seek pleasure. So to the brain, as I just mentioned earlier, you know, the status quo, the way things are right now is comfortable and familiar and should just be left alone. But the only way we're gonna grow, the only way we're gonna get better, the only way we're going to improve is if we step outside our comfort zones and do things that make us uncomfortable. I used to, my, my players would probably tell you this when I was coaching high school basketball, I used to always remind them that they needed to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And, and so, you know, as a result, I would do things in practice that I knew made them uncomfortable, not because I wanted them to fail, because I wanted them to realize that they could do so much more than they ever thought they could possibly do. So I try to do this every day in my life, and I would certainly recommend it to you, and, and you probably already do this, but to your audience, do one thing that scares you, that makes you nervous, that makes you uncomfortable, that is potentially embarrassing. It doesn't have to be a, a big thing. You know, I, I can't stand going to the dentist. So the other day I picked up the phone and, you know, made my six month appointment to have my teeth clean. Now like, oh, that's no big deal. Well, when you hate going to the dentist, yeah, it kind of is a big deal. But that's why I say if you do those small things every day, when the big disasters in life hit us, and they hit all of us, we 
lose somebody who's close to us, we get let go from our job, you know, we end up getting a chronic or a terminal kind of illness, you'll be so much more resilient to handle those things if you've done those little things every single day. Yeah, I love it. Uh, you do have to you do have to be tested. You have to test yourself, do things that's scary. I wrote that down. I, li I also like to do the hard things first uh, in the day. Like if I have something that I'm dreading, I usually just knock it out at the beginning of the day and then it's done. Because if you, if right. you say, well, I'll do it this afternoon, you know, you'll find a bunch of different things, a bunch of different reasons not to do it, right? Right. Um, in my and, and we all get to that, you know, we don't like pain. And I and, and mean, and you've seen, we've seen examples We probably know people who, what when pain hits, what do they do? They turn to alcohol, they turn to drugs, they turn to behavior that's not good for them. I guess what I'm suggesting is instead of running from pain, take that pain, flip it inside of you, burn it as fuel, use it as energy to make you a more resilient individual. If, if Trust me, I am the biggest wimp in the world. If I can do it, I promise you anybody else can do it. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be physical pain. I mean, you're talking about any no, type of pain, no. emotional, you know, just if, just challenges in life. I mean, I think it's, uh, especially for 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 men, I don't mean to stereotype here, but a lot of us men are like we shove everything down, you know, like we don't want to we don't want to talk about the pain, the stuff that's bothering us because we're too macho or whatever it is to to share it. So I think the message there is it's okay to be vulnerable too, and you know acknowledge that you know hey life's not always going to be perfect all the time. Exactly, and, and and I went to high school with a, a a basketball player by the name of Isaiah Thomas, who went on to play for Bobby Knight at Indiana, won a national championship, went on to the Detroit Pistons and won a couple of NBA championships. And so we would see each other in in the summer, you know, when we were back in Chicago. And and I would ask him, you know, what what's Knight like? And he's like, you know, great guy, cares about his players and stuff like that. But he said Knight has a saying that goes, "Mental is to physical." as four is to one. So here's this great coach teaching, you know, elite athletes to be, you know, great basketball players. But what he's really saying with that quote is that your mind or your mindset is four times more important than anything your physical body is actually going to do. A million percent agree. Okay. And I didn't know you knew Isaiah. I hope you gave him a little bit of, you know, grief when the Bulls beat him. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, because. <laughs> all right. So number three, uh, understanding that what you leave behind is what you weave in the hearts of other people. That's a great one. Can you expand? I on think that so, well? too. I, yeah, I think that's that's a legacy truth. I, I think it's it's important for all of us, regardless of what stage of life we're in, whether we're just starting out, whether we're kind of middle aged or whether we're coming to the end of the road to think about the end game. You know, what are people going to say about you? at your funeral? What do you want people, you know, to say about you at your funeral? I mean, I have friends that continue to read the obituary either in the newspaper or online for two reasons. One, to keep themselves humble and two, to remind themselves that someday somebody's going to be reading their obituary. When, when I had my leg amputated uh, back in 2020 and I found out I had these tumors in my lungs, which I'm still being treated for, I went with my wife to the mortuary and to the cemetery and to the church, and I planned my funeral. And because I do these podcasts and talks where I go out and talk about the need to continue to move forward and, and motivation, I actually got some brushback from people who commented that somehow planning my funeral was in some way defeatist. You know, and I had to remind these people that the last time I checked, we're all going to die. Don't think anybody's working on a cure for life right now. Every one of us is going to die but not every one of us is really going to live. And I heard a Native American Blackfoot proverb years ago that I absolutely love. And it goes like this. When you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. That's what I want. That's what I'm looking for. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not looking to hasten my demise in any way, but death is not nearly as scary for me because I believed I lived the purposes for which I was put on this earth to do. Totally. Bravo. That's great. Uh, that's a, that's a great share, Terry. I, I really appreciate that. And the audience appreciates that for sure. Um, great lesson. I, I'm going to definitely write that uh, quote down that you, that you shared. Um, all right. Last one. Remembering that is, and I love this and this is self-explanatory, but I'm still going to, we're still going to talk about it further. As long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. 
Yeah, I, and and like you said, I, I look at it the same way. It's pretty self-explanatory, but the way it resonates with me is this. Someday my pain is going down. You know, it may end through surgery. It may end through some type of new medication that becomes available. Quite frankly, it may end when I die. But if I quit, if I give up, if I give in to pain, then pain will always be a part of my life. So, you know, it, it's just one of those things where, Again, going back to the second uh, truth that we talked about, instead of running from pain, use it, use it to make you stronger, use it, you know, I, I, when I, I'm on a clinical trial now that uh, I, I go every three weeks to the hospital for a week, I'm, and I'm treated with a drug. And when I started this trial, it necessitated, you know, a blood draw every hour for 10 hours after the thing. So, you know, and it couldn't be, you know, from an already, I mean, they had to actually stick you with a needle and, and, and draw blood. It's like, oh, it's no big deal. Well, you get stuck enough time, you, you know, and I love my nurses. They're always like, am I hurting you? Well, I don't know. You put a needle in my arm. What do you think? You know, I mean, it's always kind of fun to, to, to talk with them, but understand the pain you're going to experience. And again, we've talked about physical pain, but the emotional pain, I think a lot of ways is worse for people than the physical pain. Physical pain, you know what to expect. You can kind of steal yourself and get ready for it. Emotional pain, that mindset that, you know what? I don't think you can do this. You're not good enough. And I always tell people, if there's something in your heart, something in your soul that you believe you're supposed to do, but it scares you, go ahead and do it. Because at the end of your life, the things you're going to regret are not gonna be the things you did. They're gonna be the things you didn't do and by then it's going to be too late to go back and do them. Yeah, that's a great run towards the fear, run towards yeah. the fear. It's usually telling you something, you know, when, right. you're, when you're, when you're scared about it. Let me ask you this. Have you, have you ever thought about quitting? And I'm not just saying with what you're faced with right now, just in anything. I, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny when I had my leg amputated, my doctor wanted to put me on chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And I was eight years into this cancer fight. And, you know, I looked at him I'm like, is it going to save my life? And he was kind of like, eh, probably not. I said, well, I'm not sure I want to do that, you know, given the outcome is going to be the same as whether I take it or not. I said, but I'll go home and I'll talk to my family. And it, it's just my wife and daughter and I, as I mentioned. So I go home and I start to tell my wife and daughter about it. And my daughter's immediately like, all right, we need a family meeting. I'm like, family meeting? There's three of us. It's not like we got a board here or something like that. you know. So we, we end up sitting around the kitchen table discussing how everybody feels about me having chemotherapy. And then my daughter's like, all right, let's take a vote. How many people want dad to have chemotherapy? And my wife and daughter raised their hand. I'm like, wait a minute. Am I getting outvoted for something that I don't want to do? But I remember back when I was in the police academy, our defensive tactics instructor used to have us bring a photograph of the people we love the most to class. And as we were learning different techniques to defend ourselves, we were to look at that photograph because he reasoned you will fight harder for the people you love than you will fight for yourself. So I ended up taking chemotherapy, not because I wanted to, but because my family wanted me to and I love them more than I love myself. And in hindsight, you know, again, I, I, you can't live your life backwards, but in hindsight, it was the right thing to do. It was the bridge that got me to do this clinical trial. And, you know, at this point in time, it, it's kept me alive for a couple of years that I probably wouldn't have had, had, you know, I not decided to do it because I love my family more than I love myself. I love it. This is, this is so great. I'm glad you're sharing. Uh, these experiences, Terry, uh, really. And all right, so let's talk about your, you got a book, right? Tell, tell, us, about, tell us about your book and where we can, where we can find it. So the, the book is called Sustainable Excellence, the 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. It's a really, it's a book that was really born out of two conversations I had. One was with a former player of mine that moved with her fiance to Colorado, where my wife and I live. And the four of us had had dinner one night. And I remember talking to her after dinner and I said, you know, I'm really excited that you're living close and I can watch you find and live your purpose. She got real quiet for a while and she looked at me and she's like, well, coach, what do you think my purpose is? I said, I have no idea what your purpose is, but that's what your life should be about. Finding the reason you were put on the face of this earth and then living that reason. So that was one conversation. And then I had a young man reach out to me on social media who was in college and he asked me what I thought were the most important things 
that he should learn not to just be successful in, in his job or in business, but to be successful in life. And I didn't want to give him the, you know, get up early, work hard, help others. Not that those aren't important. They are incredibly important. But I wanted to see if maybe I could go deeper with him. So I took some time and I was writing some notes. And eventually I had these, these 10 thoughts, these 10 ideas, these 10 principles. And then I sent the principles to him. And I sort of stepped back and I was like, you know, I've got a life story that fits underneath this principle, or I know somebody whose life emulates this principle. So literally during the, the three month period where I had my leg amputated while I was healing, and before I started chemotherapy um, for the tumors in my lungs, I sat down at the computer every day and I built stories and they're real stories about real people underneath each of the principles. And that's how sustainable excellence came to be. And you can get sustainable excellence pretty much anywhere you can get a book online, Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, Apple iBooks. You can download a free copy of the book. I've just started a membership, which kind of is a deeper dive into the, the principles in the book. Mm -hmm. So if you go to sustainableexcellencemembership.com, you can download a free copy of the book there. Nice. We'll leave those links uh, in the notes as well, for sure. Your story is super inspiring, Terry. I, I, I love it. Um, you know, you, you could have went two ways with uh, with 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 this situation, and you know, you chose this 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 path. And you know, I'm inspired, and and I and I, and I hope others are too. It's really cool when people reach out to you, you know, and 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 ask you for advice. You know, they prop I don't know where this gentleman heard you from, but reached out to you on right. social media and you're able to you're able to give back and pay it forward. Exactly. Yeah, that's great stuff. Um you mentioned your other than the website and the book, are there any what where's the best places for people to get to get in touch with you and, and learn more and, and listen to some of your shows too. You've been on over five hundred podcasts. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I started a blog called motivationalcheck.com. And every day I put up a thought for the day. And with that thought usually comes a question about maybe how you could apply that thought in your life in some way. On Mondays, I put up the Monday morning motivational message, which sometimes is a, a video that I find online that I think is motivating or a story or something like that. Uh, I also have recommendations for videos to watch, books to read, uh, my podcasts are there as well, my social media links. So motivationalcheck.com will get you to me. And you can also leave me a message there as well. As, as well. What is today's motivational tip? That's a good question. I'm, I'm going to have to I put you right on the spot. I don't remember. You're going to have to go to the... Uh, I'm going to have to go to... Yeah. I, I, go to the video. It was, uh, I, I remember it, it was something... Yeah, it was George Bernard Shaw. It's imagination is the beginning of creation. You imagine what you desire. You will, you will what you imagine. And last, you create what you will. George Bernard Shaw. And my question is, how do you create what you will in your life? Awesome. Oh, I'm glad I asked. I'm glad I asked. So, <laughs> but you check that out. You you mentioned that you keep, uh, you know, a post-it note for the four truths. I just, I, I think that that's a great thing to, to do. I have like, I have like seven post-it notes on my, on my computer, on my computer, just to remind me of stuff, you know, because again, 70 yeah. some odd thousand thoughts going through your head, you don't remember half of them, or you know, you, you can only do one at a time. So I always have like the most important stuff in front of me. And that's really helped me quite a bit. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know about you, but I actually write it down. I mean, I physically write it out. I don't type it and, and stuff like that. And, you know, from everything I, I've read and, and learned, writing something out helps you to retain it better than if you just type it and print it out and something like that. So if there are those things that are important in your life, write them down, actually physically write them out and put them somewhere like, you know, Brian and I do where you can see them every day. Yeah, I've heard that so many times. It's got to be true. The writing is is more uh, useful than than the typing. There's some scientific evidence behind that. Uh, and journaling is is really important. I didn't write for a long time. I typed, and when I started journaling, like magical things started to happen because more came out of me as I was writing. You know, it was it was almost like a stream of consciousness type of thing. So I would encourage anyone to, if you're not journaling, write. Don't type. Yeah, absolutely. Terry, before we wrap up here, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions. I see a bunch of books on your, you know, for those who are not watching on YouTube, he's got a, he's got a bunch of books. Um, any one or two that that you really love, or maybe something that you're reading now that you would that you would share? 
Yeah, there's there's a book that I absolutely love and I recommend it all the time. And, you know, people are like, why don't you recommend your book? I'm like, oh, I've already talked about my book. This is, I, I really think, an amazing book. It's called Legacy and it's written by a man by the name of James Kerr. And it, it's about the New Zealand national rugby team. And, and I don't know anything about rugby, so I'm not going to try to insult people who do, but they're called the All Blacks because their uniforms are all, all black in color. And by most accounts, they are the most successful sports franchise in any sport in any country of all times. And one of the things that I found interesting, I, I, I read it and I could, it was one of those books I couldn't put down. I took four pages of notes as I was going through it. And one of the things I thought that was amazing was when they're looking to bring somebody onto their team, a new player onto their team, I would think, you know, they want the very, if they're that good, they want the very best players. And I'm not saying they don't hire for skill, but the two things that they really hire for are character and humility. What kind of person are you? You know, what kind of person are you when you lose? Do you kick the dog and beat your wife? Or do you, you know what, I, I'm going to take this and learn from it. And then secondly, you know, I don't, I don't have all the answers. And, and I thought back to my own career as I've gone into job interviews. And you, you always, there's this angst and there's, you know, this nervousness about, I better have all the answers to all the questions that they're going to ask me. And the way the all Blacks look at it is, you don't have to have all the answers. You singularly won't have the answers. It's kind of like when I talk to young people, you know, I always tell them, hey, you're unique, but you're not special, you know, and you have unique gifts and talents and you should use those, but you're not, you're not as special as you think you are. But what, the way the all blacks look at it is you don't have to have all the answers. You singularly won't, but us collectively, us coming together will figure out the answer. So I would definitely recommend Legacy to to anybody. I mean, it's a great business book. It's a great motivational book. It's a great sports book. And, and so that would be absolutely the one. I, and, I, and I love biographies and, and autobiographies. I, I like to know what make people tick. You know, why did you do that? What made you make that decision? What was your background that got you to this point? So I, I love David McAuliffe's stuff, Harry Truman, John Adams, and things like that. So those, those are books I certainly would recommend as well. Awesome. Great share. I have not heard of that one. So I'm definitely going to going to going to pick that up and that, add that to my pile of books that I that I need to read because it's, you know, the list you and me are, both like you have list. seven posted notes, you probably have several books on your nightstand like I do, right? <laughs> so. I, I do. And you just got to get it done. Audible has been a great a great tool uh, to be cool. able to, to listen to books as well. Um, but I, I, I like that one. Okay, so let's give the uh, the sites one more time for the uh, uh, Sustainable Excellence Membership. We go to, what's the name of that site? SustainableExcellenceMembership.com. There you go. And then MotivationalCheck.com. MotivationalCheck.com. Yeah. It gets awesome. you to my blog and uh, thought for the day. Okay. Speaking of thoughts for the day, um, this has been tremendous, Terry. I really appreciate you sharing your your story and inspiring the listeners and, and myself. Um, any final thoughts that you might have or anything that I didn't ask you that you want to share? I, l let me leave you with a story, if, if I may. Um, I've, I've always been a big fan of Westerns growing up. When I was young, my mom and dad used to let me stay up late and watch, you know, Bonanza and Gunsmoke and Wild Wild West and your audience is probably like I've never heard of those shows you know mm -hmm. so but 1993 the movie Tombstone came out it was a pretty big blockbuster it starred Val Kilmer as a man by the name of John Doc Holliday and Kurt Russell as a man by the name of Wyatt Earp now Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp are two living breathing human beings who walked on the face of the earth they're not just made up characters for the movie now Doc was called Doc because he was a dentist by trade but pretty much Doc Holliday was a gunslinger and a card shark. And Wyatt Earp had been some form of a lawman most of his adult life. And somehow these two men from entirely opposite backgrounds come together and form this very close friendship. And at the end of the movie, Doc Holliday is dying of tuberculosis at a sanitarium in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, which is about three hours from where I live. Doc Holliday, the real Doc Holliday died at that sanitarium and he's buried in the Glenwood Springs Cemetery. And Wyatt at this point in his life is destitute. He has no money, he has no job, he has no prospects for a job. So every day he comes to play cards with Doc and the two men pass the time that way. And then all this almost final scene in the movie, the two men are talking about what they want out of life. And Doc says, you know, when I was younger, I was in love with my cousin, but she joined a convent over the affair. 
but she's all that I ever wanted. And then he looks at Wyatt and he says, what about you, Wyatt? What do you want? And Wyatt kind of nonchalantly says, I just want to lead a normal life. And Doc looks at him and says, there's no normal, there's just life and get on with living yours. Brian, you and I probably know people. There's probably people out in the audience listening to us that are sort of sitting back and saying, you know what? When this happens, I'll have a normal life. When that occurs, I'll have a successful life. When this arises, I'll have a significant life. What I'd like to leave your audience with is this. Don't wait. Don't wait for life to come to you. Get out there. Find the reason you were put on the face of this earth. Use your unique gifts and talents and live that reason. Because if you do, at the end of your life, I'm going to promise you two things. Number one, you're going to be a whole lot happier. And number two, you're going to have a whole lot more peace in your heart. Hmm. Love it. So I've seen that movie probably 50 times. And I love that. I love that scene at the end. And I mean, you pretty much quoted it verbatim because I, I can do the same thing. But just a just a great movie. And I, I never really thought about the connection, like the, the two different walks of life. So um I never turn that movie off every time it's on every time I see it. I just watch like it sucked in. It's tremendous. Um, thanks for sharing that, Terry. That's sure. uh, that's a that's a great final thought. Uh, really, again, appreciate you being on uh, everyone. Make it a great day.